Thank you, Curtis and Mary. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Mark, chapter 11. Ever since Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene publicly around 2,000 years ago, he has never lacked fans. There have always been people who admire Jesus, who want to learn from Jesus and learn about Jesus. He's never lacked people who want to put his image on a stained glass window. He's never lacked people who want to represent him in some form of art. Fans of Jesus abound, just as they were abounding on that first Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. But we need Palm Sunday to remind us that Jesus calls us to be more than fans. He calls us to be Followers. Followers. What's the difference? And I challenge you to ask yourself today, are you a fan of Jesus or a follower of Jesus? His followers are far fewer. And to see the difference, we need to back up our reading, just a few verses, to Mark chapter 10. And I hope you'll look there with me as we look at Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. Because Mark is very careful in how he tells the story of Jesus. And in order to emphasize something about one story, he draws something out in the previous story, or in the story that comes after it. And so we need to know this story that comes just prior to the story of Palm Sunday in Mark 11. So Mark 10, verse 46. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up! On your feet! He's calling you! Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed, note that word, he followed Jesus along the road, literally along the way, the way, not just any road, but the way, the way of Jesus Christ. So why does Mark tell this story right before the Palm Sunday procession? He tells it to show two truths that I want to highlight for us today. The first is that fans of Jesus treasure him in their hearts. Fans of Jesus treasure him in their hearts. They admire him. They value him. They value what he brings to their lives. They admire his goodness. They admire his transforming power. They admire his compassion for sinners. All of that. They treasure Jesus in their hearts. But followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus, know that Jesus, Jesus has transformed their hearts. Followers of Jesus have had their hearts transformed by him. They don't just treasure him in their hearts. They have had their hearts transformed, changed by him. See this in Bartimaeus. 
see how he goes from a beggar on the side of the road to someone following the Lord Jesus on the way. He goes from being a fan, crying out to Jesus, Son of David, a lofty title, an impressive title, Son of Israel's greatest king, David. But he doesn't just treasure Jesus in his heart. He is transformed by Jesus, starting with his heart. And yes, he regains his vision, but all the miracles in the Gospels are all pointing to the greatest miracle, which is that God can save sinners. It's never just about the healing. It's never just about this miracle. They're all signs pointing to God's unrivaled power to save people like you and me. So that's the first truth. Fans just treasure Jesus in their heart. Followers have had their hearts transformed by Jesus. The second is that fans of Jesus see him. They look for Jesus. But followers of Jesus know that Jesus also sees them. Followers of Jesus know that he also sees them. And how different is this from how most of us come to church and come before Jesus? We come looking for Jesus. It's Palm Sunday after all. Who is this person who comes in the name of the Lord? Who is this person that people are hailing as a son of David? Who is this person who seems to be the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah? Everybody's looking at Jesus, and that's what we're going to see in chapter 11. Everybody's looking at Jesus. He is center stage. But no one is aware of what Jesus sees when he looks at them. And how often do you come to church or come before God's word looking for Jesus instead of wondering, what does Jesus see when he looks at me? What does Jesus see? We don't just look for Jesus. We know Jesus is looking at us, and he sees us. And there's great challenge in that, but also wonderful, wonderful, life-transforming good news about that. So as we pick up our reading at verse 1 of chapter 11, let's ask the question, what does Jesus see? What does Jesus see? What does he see when he looks at you, when he looks at me? What he sees us doing right now? He's looking at us right now. Do you realize that? Because he's not just a figure on a stained glass window. He's not just a character in a book. He's not just a figure in history for us to learn about and marvel at. The Christian faith says that he is the risen and living Lord. The risen and living Lord, and he is present with us now through the Holy Spirit. Are you aware of his presence? That's the question. So let's read together, beginning at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, Some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem 
and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So what does Jesus see? First, notice that Jesus sees more than we see. Jesus sees more than we see. As they approach Jerusalem, he tells his disciples, go to the village ahead of you and you're going to find a colt tied up there, which no one has ever ridden. And someone's going to ask you, why are you taking it? And when they ask you, say, the Lord has need of it. And he will send it back shortly. Then they bring it, and they start throwing their cloaks on the ground. They start putting down branches that they've cut in the fields. What's going on? Jesus sees these seemingly insignificant details, a colt tied up, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. He sees them as part of God's grand redemptive design, as part of God's plan of salvation to send one who is to reign on David's throne. Everything he's doing here carries messianic overtones. Everything. Riding on a donkey. David rode on a donkey. His son Solomon rides on a donkey when he comes to Jerusalem as king. Everything about these little mundane details are chock full of meaning and significance about who Jesus is. Does the crowd realize that? Well, in part, but not fully. They know that the Messiah is supposed to come on a colt. It's in the prophets. Look at Zechariah 9.9. They know that there's precedent for taking off your cloaks and putting them on the ground. There's precedent for palm branches. Various leaders in Israel's history have done this. They see that, and they see that Jesus is coming as the promised Messiah, but they don't recognize fully what Jesus is doing. Jesus is coming in fulfillment of that great promise that God made to David that we read in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with flogging inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This promise of an eternal kingdom, an eternal throne, Solomon fulfilled it in part. Various leaders throughout the history of Israel have fulfilled it in part, but no one seems to fully match the description of what God promised to his people until now. Until now. And Jesus knows all of that. Jesus sees all of that. He sees beyond what the crowd sees. He sees beyond what you see and what I see. And why is it that he can see that way? Jesus sees more because he knows more. And he knows more because he is more. He is more. While it's possible that Jesus has made some prior arrangements to have this cult be at a specific location, Mark doesn't tell us that. Mark doesn't tell us that. Mark is showing that Jesus has a unique ability to know. 
to see inside people, to know what they're thinking. He's said this in Mark 2. When a paralytic requests healing, and some people say, you can't do that on the Sabbath, and some people are saying he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In Mark 2, verse 8, we read immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And Jesus heals him. Jesus has a unique authority and a unique power to forgive sins, to know what we're thinking. He sees more because he knows more because he is more. And he is more because he's the Lord. And while in Mark 11, when the disciples say the Lord needs it, some people may think, oh, that just means the master. This donkey's master has need of it. But as readers of the Gospel of Mark, we know that Jesus is the Lord. He's told us that in the very first verses of his Gospel. In Mark 1, verse 3, a voice of one calling out in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Jesus is the Lord. An orthodox Christian teaching is that Jesus is one person who possesses two natures. He is both fully divine and he is fully human. He's not half human and half divine. He is fully human and fully divine in one person. And while Jesus does not always exercise his divine knowledge, he does sometimes. But his hunger is real hunger. His thirst is real thirst. His blood is real blood. Fully human. All of that is behind what Mark is saying here. And if that sounds really complicated and hard to understand, well, it is, but it's the best way to try to make sense of Jesus and how complicated he is. That he knows that there's this cult tied there. He knows what the people are going to ask all because he's the Lord. So who is he to you? Do you believe that Jesus can see more than you can see? Because he is more. Do you believe that Jesus, right now, in this moment, today, has the power and the authority to see you? Or is he simply a figure on the pages of Scripture? He sees more than we do. But he also sees what we don't want to see. He sees what we don't want to see. This is often called the triumphal entry. There's all kinds of celebration here. People are crying out based on Psalm 118, Hosanna, save us, which by this time was also a shout of praise, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They're ready to praise. They're ready to celebrate. They're ready to triumph. Yes, Jesus is finally in Jerusalem. Yes, everything we've been waiting for has reached its culmination. And they think that now is the moment when someone like David, a great king like David, is going to finally deal with those Romans, with the oppressors, with corrupt temple officials. He's going to finally bring God's kingdom come. And they're not entirely wrong, are they? It's just they don't know how Jesus does it. They don't really know where he's going. They want to celebrate, even his disciples. But what they're missing is the fact that Jesus, three times now, has told them, that he is headed to the cross to suffer and to die. For example, Mark 8, verse 31. We 
We read, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. He wasn't hiding anything. He told them he was on his way to suffer, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The disciples are ready for triumph. How can Jesus even talk about betrayal? How can he even talk about suffering? But that's where he's going. And so Jesus, as he's riding on this donkey, this borrowed donkey, he knows that he is headed to Calvary. We don't really want to think about that, do we? We come to church to, to get a boost, right? We want to feel good. We want some warm and fuzzies. We don't want to think about suffering. We don't want to think about agony. We don't want to think about death. But unless you follow Jesus on the way to the cross, then you have missed the point of Jesus. This is why he came into the world. To suffer and to die. Now, here's an even more uncomfortable truth. While we want to celebrate, we we like a good parade, we like a good procession, we're all over that. We also miss the point of the enemy that Jesus came to deal with. Jesus didn't come to deal with the Romans because the Romans aren't really the problem. Yes, they're oppressors. Yes, they could be cruel. But that's not really why he came. Jesus came to do battle against your greatest enemy and my greatest enemy the sin that is present in your heart and in mine. That's why Jesus had to die. It wasn't just to show us how an innocent person can suffer. It wasn't just to show us the love of God and and someone who makes a sacrifice. It was to do for you and do for me what we can never do for ourselves. Namely, suffer the just penalty that we deserve for our rebellion against a holy and righteous God. For all the things that we have failed to do, for all the things we failed to say, for all the ways we failed to live holy, righteous lives, for all the things that we've thought and we know we shouldn't have thought. Jesus sees what we don't want to see. We don't want to see that we need him to die for us. We want a savior, yeah, absolutely. But we need a savior who deals with the enemy out there, right? Whoever your political enemy is, whoever you think is really the problem in the world, we want somebody to deal with that, don't we? But to say, I'm the problem, you're the problem? Oh, We don't want to see that. We don't want to acknowledge that, do we? But it is not until we confess that and acknowledge that that you really understand Jesus and who he is and why he came. So many people think that Jesus just came to be a great moral teacher. So many people think that Jesus just came to show us what the good life looks like. So many people think that Jesus just happened to die because he spoke truth to power. No, Jesus died according to God's sovereign providential plan. He who knew no sin, he had no sin in him. He is fully God, fully man. He had no sin, and yet for you and for me, he became sin so that through him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's why he came. And you see this in the Gospel of Mark. If you back up to chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to pay the price for your life. He came to pay the penalty that you owe 
for sinning against a holy God. Now, we read that verse and we think, well, doesn't Jesus want us to serve him? Doesn't he want us to pray to him? Doesn't he want us to give our tithes and offerings to him? Doesn't he want us to sing hymns and, and come to church and, and, and exalt his name? Yes. But that's not all he wants. He came to serve sinners like you and like me. And we're not prepared to really serve him, to answer his call to ministry, until we know what he has done for us. Amen? Until we know what he has done to serve us. That's why he came, to pay a price you could never pay. Pay a price I could never pay. He sees what we don't want to see. As we look at the conclusion here, verse 11 it doesn't get any more anticlimactic than this, does it? After all the buildup, here's Jesus. All kinds of messianic messages being sent here. And then we're told he entered Jerusalem. He went to the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but it was late, so he went home with the twelve. Wait a second. That's it? Well, the Gospel of Mark, uniquely among the foreign Gospels, puts this in to put the brakes on our false expectations about what Jesus came to do, to show us that Jesus also sees what we don't want him to see. Jesus sees what we don't want him to see. What does he see when he looks around at the temple what he sees, is, as we can tell by this incident with the fig tree right after this, what he sees is the spiritual bankruptcy of the temple system. What he sees is the shallow, superficial spirituality of so many people who claim to speak for God and who claim to live for God. The very next day, he's on his way and he sees this fig tree that has green leaves, but there's no fruit it looks like it should be fruitful. And Jesus curses it and says, may no one ever eat from you again. And this is a prophetic, symbolic action to show this is just like the temple. And it's from there that Jesus goes and starts flipping tables and saying, you have turned the house of God into a den of robbers. You have abused why God gave this good gift in the first place. But we don't want Jesus to to see that, right? Especially not when he starts turning tables in our own hearts, and our own minds. Yeah, turn those tables. <laughs> Deal with those people. Don't mess with me. Oh no. Jesus has a piercing, possessive gaze. He sees more than we see. He sees what we don't want to see, and he even sees what we don't want him to see. Oh yes. Because just as Jesus looks around here, we have a parallel in Mark 3, verse 5. And there's a question about the Sabbath. Is it lawful to do good or evil, to save life or to kill? They remain silent. And don't miss this. Mark 3, 5. He looked around at them. Same word as in Mark eleven eleven. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to them, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. He sees inside of you. He sees inside of me. He sees what we don't ever want him to see. And while, yes, that's painful at first, it's ultimately for your good, for Jesus to see inside of you. Consider the man who came up to Jesus in Mark 10. Verse 17, he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus' goodness is derived from his Father. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him 
and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. There are so many people in the church who are fans of Jesus. Maybe they've said the sinner's prayer. They've invited Jesus into their heart. They admire him. They treasure him in their heart. But their hearts have never been transformed by him. Because while they respect Jesus, they don't want Jesus to tell them, you lack one thing. We want Jesus to score us on what we've done. And this man gets an A plus for being a good person. He command, he's followed God's commandments. A plus. But in following Jesus, he fails. All because he lacks one thing. And the point of this is not for everybody to go get rid of all their wealth. That's not the point. The point is to ask yourself, what is the one thing in your life that's keeping you from a wholehearted surrender and submission to Jesus as Lord? Don't think you can hide it from him. He sees. He knows. And the more willing and ready you are to let him have access to that, to the darkest recesses of your life, to the darkest recesses of your thoughts, to what's going on in your heart that the Bible tells us is deceitful above all things. When you allow God to have access to that, the Holy Spirit comes in and he does a powerful, unique, transforming work in you. And if anyone here says, oh no, not my heart, I promise you the power of God can do anything. He can even change your life. But first, you've got to be willing to confess Jesus sees what I don't want him to see. So I ask you, is there one thing that you lack today? Is there one sinful thought, one sin that that you are clinging to is so precious, but you don't want Jesus to touch that because you love it too much? What is it? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. You can't hide it from him. You can run. Absolutely, you can run. But one day, every single one of us will stand before the one man that God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And that man is the Lord Jesus. And that man can change you from the inside out. Will you let him? Will you say, Jesus, yes, here's my heart. Take it, seal it. I want to be yours. And where I'm clinging to something that is bad for me, God, kill that in me. Crucify that in me. You see it. I know I can't hide it from you. What is that in your life? Give it to him. He knows what to do with it. He knows what to do with it. He is compassionate. He is merciful. He is full of free grace for sinners like us if we will turn to him, call to him, and allow him to come in and change us from the inside out. And if you have never done that in your life before, or maybe you thought you did, but you realize, no, I haven't, because I still lack one thing. I don't just want to be a fan of Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus because I know that's where real change happens. Then may this be the day of salvation for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, as we consider this familiar story of Palm Sunday, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves in the story. That by the help of your Holy Spirit, 
we would be convicted if we're merely fans of Jesus. If we can sing the praises of Jesus, if we admire Jesus, if we think a lot of Jesus, if we can say wonderful and true words about Jesus, but we're not following him. Lord, convict us. Help us to get back in line if we have wondered, if we are backsliding. Help us to get back on the way to follow Jesus to the cross. The cross that has the power to save us all because of what Jesus has done on it for sinners like us. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that even though you see in our hearts, you know our evil thoughts, that didn't keep Jesus from dying in our place. He knew it all, and he still went to the cross for people like us. Lord, drive that truth home deeply today. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.